Have you heard of SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin? Well, if you're interested in increasing your testosterone, then listen up. SHBG is one of the things that we test for to get your free testosterone, which is more indicative of the actual amount of testosterone that's available to you that can help improve symptoms of low testosterone. I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon, and in today's video, we're going to talk all about SHBG and how changes at SHBG can affect your free testosterone level and ultimately your symptoms. Testosterone is important for a lot of different things, and we have receptors for testosterone all over the body, including the brain. So people who have low levels of testosterone will have symptoms like low libido, erectile dysfunction, poor sleep difficulty gaining muscle mass, increased fat, and even depression. And each of these symptoms can vary from person to person. So if someone presents with low testosterone, some may have issues with erectile dysfunction and others may not. Somebody might present with symptoms of feeling fatigue and decreased interest in sex, while others may have depression and have low energy. When we think about testosterone in our bodies, it lives in three forms tightly bound, loosely bound, and free. So it's tightly bound to something called sex hormone binding globulin, which is what we're talking about today. And that's about 45% of all of our testosterone is tightly bound to SHBG. That means it's not freely available for your body to use to activate all the receptors in our body to create those good symptoms of having a normal testosterone level. And it's loosely bound to albumin mostly, about 50%, and then corticotropin binding globulin, which is a hormone from the hypothalamus that causes some downstream effects. And then about 1% to 2% is freely available. While all the guidelines say total testosterone is the only standardized available test that we should use to assess for hypogonadism or low testosterone, a lot of us who practice sexual medicine will actually calculate a free testosterone. And we calculate it because the free testosterone that you get on the blood work is not as reliable as one that's calculated. So sometimes you'll see on your blood work that you get a total testosterone as well as a sex hormone binding globulin. And there's freely available calculators to actually calculate your free testosterone. And I'll link a couple down below. There's even an iPhone app. And if you remember from some of my prior videos, the levels of testosterone and SHBG will change throughout the day. And this is because they rely on a circadian rhythm, meaning testosterone peaks in the early morning and it decreases by the end of the day, just like the sun does. And similarly, SHBG will do the opposite. It is lowest in the morning and highest later in the late afternoon or evening. And so it's important to get these tests done early in the morning to assess how your true testosterone SHB levels are, because that's sort of where the reference values come from. Now, in younger men, these variations are much more significant. However, as men age, this circadian rhythm actually tends to blunt a bit. So generally speaking, the testosterone levels are a little bit more stable throughout the day. Now, they still have a bump in the early morning and a decrease later on in the day. But overall, generally speaking, it's less of a difference. So how much free testosterone do you actually need? Well, there's a couple studies that have looked at this. In a New England Journal study that was published in 2010, they found that symptoms were most often correlated with a free testosterone of less than 64 picograms per milliliter or 6.4 nanograms per deciliter. Well, what is the normal range? Well, another study in 2015 looked at the ranges of free testosterone across multiple different studies that looked at a variety of men, the European Men's Aging Study, the Framingham Heart Study. They found that the distribution of free testosterone in community-dwelling men above 40 ranged anywhere from 38 picograms per milliliter or 3.8 nanograms per deciliter to all the way up to almost 400 picograms per milliliter or 40 nanograms per deciliter. So it can be quite a wide range. Generally, we should be seeing that 1% to 2% of your testosterone is freely available for use by your body. Now, as I mentioned, SHBG is the component that binds testosterone strongly. And there are a number of conditions that can either increase SHBG and therefore make less free testosterone available or decrease SHBG. Now, typically, this, the things where we see decreased SHBG, we're also seeing decreased testosterone. Our body tends to adapt to these changes. So if your testosterone decreases, then you will see your SHBG decrease as well. 
So interestingly, the most common thing that decreases SHBG is hyperinsulinemia. So if you have diabetes, your SHBG will go down. So people will sometimes say that, oh, if you do these diets, like ketogenic diets, you'll actually see your testosterone go down because it's actually creating a low insulin state. But that's not exactly true. In fact, I reviewed a few studies on ketogenic diet and testosterone previously, so check those out. In fact, what they found in these studies were that people on a ketogenic diet actually had higher testosterone levels. Other conditions that can decrease SHBG are hypothyroidism, which we know can decrease testosterone. Steroids, progestins, or any androgenic steroid therapy can decrease SHBG, which we know can also affect the ability of our body to produce testosterone. And then obesity can also decrease SHBG. But again, a lot of these things are because your body's natural production of testosterone goes down with these conditions. Now, what about increased SHBG? If we have too much SHBG, then our testosterone is getting bound up and it's not freely available for your body. So what sort of conditions cause an increased SHBG? We know that SHBG goes up with aging. That is a known factor and unfortunately a part of aging. We also see it in people who have hyperthyroidism, who have increased estrogen, or who have HIV or hepatitis or hepatic cirrhosis. Now, if you have a thyroid condition or diabetes, it's always valuable to optimize that. But what are other ways that you can optimize your SHBG level? Now, before we get into that, it's important to realize that SHBG is very variable from person to person. There are clearly variabilities in terms of how much SHBG a person makes, and it may be genetic in nature. Now, Interestingly, the times that we find this most useful is when people have testosterone that's sort of on the borderline. It's not very high, it's not very low, but they're having symptoms because then we may see that SHBG is elevated and that their free testosterone is actually lower. There's actually some interest in looking at SHBG levels and type 2 diabetics because as I mentioned, insulin actually suppresses SHBG. And so you would expect that people with diabetes have low SHBG levels. But in fact, when they've studied men with diabetes, they found that having diabetes as well as an elevated SHBG and having a low testosterone combined with being over the age of 66 can significantly increase mortality. So they found that men who were over the age of 66 with a total testosterone of less than 12 nanomoles per liter or 346 nanograms per deciliter and an SHBG of greater than 35 nanomoles per liter put you at higher risk of mortality. If you had two of those factors, your risk was 22.5%. And if you had all three, your risk was 25%. And this is why this is important because testosterone is so valuable for so many things. It is not just for erections. It is not just for libido. It helps with cognition. It helps with muscle mass. It helps with reducing fat. And these are all important for overall health and preventing mortality. So it's super important to think about testosterone as a vital hormone. And having good testosterone levels, good hormone health is a surrogate of overall health and vitality. So now let's get back to it. What can we do? So what about diet? So we know that having too little fat in your diet will decrease testosterone. If you don't know why, check out my video on testosterone natural boosting, where I talk about all the different things that can affect testosterone. But essentially, you need some amount of fat to create testosterone based on the pathways that create testosterone using cholesterol. Dietary data is somewhat conflicting. And SHBG in women is also a problem. Having elevated SHBG can cause the same issues with decreased free testosterone and decreased libido, although it's not studied quite as well. So they've looked at different things in both women and men. In some studies, they've seen that fiber decreases SHBG levels, whereas vegetarians actually increase SHBG levels. And ultimately, very low calorie diets actually significantly increase SHBG. So what is the best data that we have? Well, there was a study looking at the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, and they assessed 1,500 men between the age of 40 and 70. And they looked at a number of factors in these men, but some of these included obviously getting blood work and assessing their hormone levels, 
but also assessing their nutrition intake. And these men were between the ages of 40 and 70, and they were 95% Caucasian and were meant to reflect the population of Boston. So this is not reflective of every type of human being, of every race and ethnicity, but this is probably the best data we have, at least at this point. And so what they did was they took a food frequency questionnaire from them and they had them assess their food frequency over the course of a year. And as I mentioned, they also assessed their hormone levels, but they took it twice within two hours of waking. So they were getting the best values possible for these men. And the best part of this data is that they were able to control for a lot of confounding factors, right? They were able to control for BMI, weight, height, other conditions that they may have to assess that does changes in diet actually affect SHBG specifically or are other factors causing the change. So after controlling for testosterone and estradiol, which again can affect SHBG, they found two things that increased SHBG or were positively correlated with an increased SHBG, and that was age and dietary fiber. That doesn't mean that you should stop eating fiber, but that's what they found. And then what negatively correlated with SHBG, meaning that higher levels of this decreased SHBG or may decrease SHBG, was protein and body mass index. So the higher your body mass index, the lower your SHBG, which we already know obesity causes decreased SHBG. Again, not a desirable way to decrease your SHBG. We know that protein increases insulin levels. And we know increased insulin decreases SHBG. And so that makes sense. But interestingly, carbohydrates did not see the same effect. So we know that carbohydrates clearly increase insulin, but they didn't show the same effect as protein. So what would I recommend in terms of diet? I do not think decreasing fiber intake is a good idea because fiber has other benefits, particularly in preventing colon cancer. And so I would strongly suggest increasing fiber intake. It's also good for your gut microbiome, as I've talked about in my podcast with both Dr. Kumkum Patel and Dr. Amy Shah. So check those out if you want to learn more. But I think fiber is really important, but clearly protein is beneficial. Does that mean it has to be animal protein? No. Does that mean it has to be fatty proteins? No. It needs to be protein that is generally healthy. Now, you want to try to get ideally grass-fed meats. You can also eat plant-based protein, but generally increasing protein intake may be beneficial. Now, what about supplements, right? Are there supplements that can increase SHBG? So as I mentioned before, obviously get your insulin checked, your thyroid hormones checked, get your estradiol checked when you're getting evaluated for low testosterone, because all of these things can affect SHBG and ultimately how much testosterone is available for your body before you go and try any supplements. Now, supplements, a lot of people talk about supplements like boron, magnesium, and zinc. Now, the thought is that these supplements work by increasing the bioavailability of testosterone so that more of it is available to your body. The boron data, however, is only in one study on eight athletic young men. Eight. Eight men. So there's never been a study after that initial study on eight men looking at the positive effects of boron. So can you try boron? Sure, you could, but there's not a ton of data presenting. There's a lot of anecdotal data. If you look on YouTube, you're going to find hundreds of videos of people talking about boron. You're going to look on Reddit threads. There's hundreds of people talking about it, and it may help, but it's not based on rigorous scientific data. You can also consider eating foods high in boron, like dates, raisins, plums. Those sorts of things could actually increase boron levels. If you are deficient in zinc or magnesium, which you could easily check with a blood test, these repleting these micronutrients can be helpful for a number of things, including improving your hormone milieu and decreasing SHBG. So the one supplement that I think does have some merit in decreasing SHBG is vitamin D. Now, you know that a large portion of society is deficient in vitamin D. And there was recently a systematic review published that looked at the association of vitamin D with testosterone. Now, what the systematic review found after looking at eight different articles and analyzing the data, they found that vitamin D was correlated with increasing testosterone in some studies, but not in others, and it wasn't strong enough to make a conclusion. But they did see that increased vitamin D intake or normal vitamin D levels saw a decrease or at least stability in the levels of SHBG. And as I mentioned, SHBG increases with age. So vitamin D, particularly if you're deficient, can be very helpful 
in improving your SHBG levels. Ultimately, what I would say is go to your doctor and get blood tests done. If you don't want to go to your doctor, there's tons of services available online where you can check your vitamin D, your zinc, your magnesium, your thyroid levels, make sure you're not diabetic, and assess all of these factors as well as your SHBG and your testosterone to see where things lie. Your blood work is just that, blood work. It is not how you're feeling. It is not your symptom. Your blood work is just that. It is numbed. It is not tell me how you're feeling, if you're improving, if your symptoms are getting better, or if your symptoms are even bothering you at all. At the end of the day, the important thing is to treat you and your symptoms. You should assess what is bothering you and then see how you can fix it. Many of these things, including the symptoms with low testosterone, are multifactorial. In fact, a lot of people think erectile function or dysfunction is caused primarily by low testosterone. But in fact, we know that only 3 to 6% of people who have erectile dysfunction is it caused by low testosterone. The large majority of people have other causes of erectile dysfunction. So it's important then to assess essentially what is the symptom you're trying to treat? Are there other things that are bothering that symptom or might be causing that symptom? And attacking it from all angles and figuring out what the issue is and then tracking your improvement over time. And realizing that sometimes... The improvement may take some time and may take some trial and error. And that's where I think personalized medicine is super important. We're not just treating numbers, we're treating you. And so it's really important to check that out. So if you are looking for a urologist to evaluate your hormone health, feel free to make an appointment to see me, Rena Malik, MD slash appointments. I see patients in person in Newport Beach, California, as well as online for seven different states. And if you are not residing in those states, I will also do an educational visit where we can talk about your issues, but I cannot give you a diagnosis or prescribe you any treatment, but ultimately allows me to review your health and discuss things that may be causing issues. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my video on testosterone levels optimized by your age, because a lot of people come see me and their testosterones are low normal, but they're in their 40s and 50s. So what exactly is normal for you? And as always, remember to take care of yourself because you are worth it.